I want to confess, uh, I guess this is probably my former Catholic girl coming out right now, so start to talk with a confession, right? I have a pet peeve. I have a couple of pet peeves, but I want to share one today with you. I have a pet peeve about something that happens in the media a lot. It has to do with uh, people who are professionals, such as attorneys or medical professionals or mental health professionals, who look at a public figure, a celebrity of some sorts, a sports figure, a politician, an an, an artist in some way, and uh, make a determination about that person in some way, shape, or form. They'll often say, while Dr. So-and-so has never examined XYZ celebrity, they are certain that they're probably on a path of self-destruction and very likely have now been prescribed antidepressants and their doctor has probably blah, 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 blah. And they give this whole thing, though they've never talked to the person, they've never seen the person, they've never examined the person, they don't know the person's story, they know nothing about what's going on in that person's individual life, but they make this grand, grand, does that bother you too? It bothers me. I think, I think, wow, that's just not cool. It's not true. And it, and it fosters something in our society that I think is so challenging and that it fosters the continuation of believing that anyone has a right to look at someone and come to conclusions like that. Hear one sentence that someone says and draw conclusions. See one appearance and draw a bunch of conclusions. And it's a, a mistake that we're making as we're dealing with one another. It's the stuff that that clickbait, things that come into to, uh, play in ads and stuff. Clickbait is where they'll put those salacious stories at the bottom where we, they want us to click so we can see the ads and we can read the salacious material about people that is not even necessarily accurate. It's tabloid consciousness. It's not accurate reporting or accurate conversation about a person. It's just, you know, it could be this. And we all go, oh. And I shouldn't say we all go. Some of us go, oh, because we get, can get caught up in it. It can be very tempting to get caught up in it. It's a pet peeve because I call it soundbite consciousness. A little soundbite, a little snippet of something we see or sense, and a whole bunch of conclusions are drawn or made about that person. And it's not healthy for us as a society. Respectful from a human perspective and a soul perspective because we rarely know the wholeness of a person. It prompts us to behave badly in terms of our own experience because it prompts us into criticism and undue judgment, which can be harmful to the other person. They may or may never know about it, but the person who does it, 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 it harms us to be critical and judgmental of other people. It breaks down the fabric and fiber of our soul. It disrespects us when we have a look at another person and think that we're going to judge and criti- criticize them and sometimes hoping that we can lift ourselves up a little bit more. It encourages such behavior to continue. For those of us who are in relationships with other people who are around us a lot, including our spouse or partner or the children who are around us, it encourages that and it encourages that co- continuous behavior in our society, which is disconnect. And it encourages us to do something which I just don't understand, to gather together around who we hate, to come together around who we hate. Just think about that for a minute, how destructive that can be to our society and to us. And it also is separation consciousness at its core, which is the spiritual undergirding of this entire message. Both as we're tempted to to practice soundbite consciousness towards other people or as we feel that kind of soundbite consciousness towards us. It's a tearing down of wholeness. It's an attempt to live in a state of separation versus a state of oneness and connectedness. And what can I say today? How can I perceive people today in a way that draws me into connection versus pushes me into separation? That's the question. There's a very famous uh, phrase that the master teacher Jesus is quoted from preachers and people all over the world who are followers of this great man. 
but many don't necessarily know the story of how it actually occurred. It's, it, it occurs at the very end, about a week before uh, Palm Sunday in the timeline of Jesus' life. And Jesus and his disciples are gathered together, and they're talking about the, uh, the tabernacle feast that's about to occur. And um, there are people who are angry with him. It's the first time in the story that we hear that even uh, the Jewish followers are angry with him right now in this timeline. And the reason they're angry with him is because he had the audacity to heal a sick person on the Sabbath. And there's a lot of belief that you don't do stuff like that on the Sabbath. And so the Jewish people are now even wanting, uh, are angry with him and judging him and, and talking smack basically about Jesus. <laughs> and they didn't even have the internet back then. So that might have, that must have occurred, you know, in uh, stories to people to people. And so the disciples are saying to him, hey, aren't you going to come with us to the feast? And he's saying, no, no, I don't want to go to the feast. You guys go, you go, have a good time. I'm, I'm going to stay right here. And so the disciples go off to the feast, and they're at this big feast. And it says in the gospel, and, and this is from John, it says that Jesus went privately after they had left. He decided suddenly to go privately to the feast. And as I researched, what did they mean when they're saying privately? And I think it was an indication that the following week he was going to return very publicly on a, a donkey on, you know, Palm Sunday. So privately to the, to the scholars means that he kind of snuck into the feast, basically. And he, and he went to the front of wherever the feast was occurring and he began to lecture. He couldn't help himself. That's what happens to ministers sometimes, you know. <laughs> he just couldn't help himself. And he started talking to them about, hey, I know you're angry with me for having healed someone on the Sabbath, but I challenge you guys to look at things you might have done on the Sabbath that violate the, the holy rules. Because all of us have made those kind of mistakes. We're, not, we're all imperfect. We all do that sort of thing. And he says this iconic phrase that many of us quote. He says from John chapter 7, verse 24, do not judge by appearances. We know that part, right? He goes on to say, but judge with right judgment. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And I think he's talking about this. Today, we're, my message is about transcending the sound bites. And what that means to me is exactly what Jesus is talking about. When we are tempted to fall into judging the sound bites, using a sound bite to judge another person, we are judging by appearances. We are judging by a little bit of information, a little bit of something that we've seen, a little bit. And Jesus is admonishing us not to do that from a spiritual perspective. But it all, he also talks about right judgment. Now, what is right judgment? In my mind, I think what he's talking about, right judgment, is that we all live together and we all uh, are seeking to create a better life on planet Earth, and we all do need to receive throughout our life, in our workplace, in our most important relationships, we need to be, remain open and teachable and receive people's feedback. And we need to learn as human beings how to be centered in feedback that we choose to give, how to be in a place of love, how to be motivated from love and not motivated from righteousness and motivated in the wrong ways that Jesus is talking about. And that's what I want to explore today, that transcending the sound bites means getting clearer with ourselves when we're tempted to, to judge another or when we're being judged, to get clear about what we do with the judgment that comes our way. And I not only have some philosophizing to do about that today, to fix what might need fixing, right? But also some action steps that I suggest in both of these arenas to support us on our path. So let's start with when we are 
tempted to be sound biters, when we are sound biting ourselves, when we are somebody who uh, maybe can admit that around a certain group of people or around a, a certain person or in certain situations when we're with a certain group of friends, we tend to be sound biters, meaning maybe we are judgers, we are very critical, we are gossipers, we spend time uh, tearing other people down versus building other people up. We can all fall into that trap when we feel like we want to fit in or when we have a habit of mind. And that's exactly what I want to take a look at today. Because what we find with that is that oftentimes we as human beings are tempted to look at other people through the eyes of our own lens. And what that means is we tend to, we tend to glob onto people that there, there's some aspect of our ego or some part of our brain that, in, in, that mistakenly thinks that if everybody was more like me, things would be a lot better, right? If everybody just did things the way I do them, if everybody would just make the same choices that I would make if I were in that situation, if everybody would just listen to me, things would be a lot better. And so we, we have this part of our brain that we have to admit is constantly projecting. If people could just be blah, 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 and a lot of it's related to us. It's related to how we see ourselves in an idyllic form. It's sometimes related to how we see uh, the mistakes that we've made and we want to prevent other people from the, mistake, the same mistake. So sometimes there's almost an altruistic sense to it, but ultimately we tend to do this to other people. We want them to be more like us, even though we can all look around and see that in terms of the universe and in terms of this beautiful planet, the universe operates in this principle called oneness and diversity. It's all connected, it's all interconnected, and yet it's all beautifully diverse. That whatever it was that created this universe had no need and clearly no desire for there to be one flower, one kind of tree, and one kind of human being. Indeed, whatever it was that created this universe, the divine, God, the source, well, just look around. It clearly has a desire for diversity. It clearly has no need for sameness as the one way to do things. But we human beings, sometimes out of a need for safety, out of a need for thinking we've got the solutions, want people to do things the same way as us. And so we get kind of judgmental and critical when people don't do that. Or we have habitual thoughts about groups of people or kinds of people. And we think, well, all men this and all women or women of a certain age should blah, 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 blah. Or people who are LGBTQ should blah, 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 blah. Or all Italians should or all kids should. Whatever our, our thing is that we're habitually plopping onto people, we can get caught up in that. And we need to understand that when we are about these kind of judgments and these kind of criticisms and these almost kind of, of, of intense pushing people to see things our way and do things our way, that we're practicing soundbite consciousness. And what this is a lot of times in the world of psychology is called projection. We also project our pain onto people, our painful past. If someone reminds us of someone who hurt us in the past, we, we might treat them a certain way. If someone re remi I remember years ago in my healing journey as uh, some, a man reminded me of my father and I was doing healing work with my father and I did not like this man at all. And all I knew about him, the truth, all I knew about him is he reminded me of my dad. He wasn't my dad and he actually didn't really behave like my dad but he looked at me a certain way, he said something a certain way and I was projecting right onto him. Years ago when I was in the midst of, of going through a divorce with my first husband, Brad, we were, t we were sharing about it very publicly. We were telling people about it. We were being very open about it. And we were clear that there was still love between us, but that we were going in different paths and that we were having a very sane and easy parting. But when we announced it at church in my former community, I remember at least two or three women who came up to me and said, be sure he doesn't take all your money. They were projecting. Clearly, their experience caused them to give me some feedback 
some input that had nothing to do with me and everything to do with them. And that's what I'm suggesting we're doing when we're judging by appearances. That part of what we have to ask ourselves is, does this have to do with me and my perceptions about things? Or am I really thinking of them? Am I just coming from a place of pain in me or a place of, of, of unhealed past in me as I'm telling people what they should do? And so we are prone to do this as a society. I heard a story recently about a woman named Rosalind Brewer. We have her photo here. And her, she's also known as Roz. She's an American businesswoman. And she is very accomplished. She was the, I don't know what this means to be the group president, but she was the group president and COO of Starbucks. She already wins points in my book right there. <laughs> and she was the CEO of Sam's Club, and she also held various uh, leadership positions at Walmart and in Kimberly Clark. And in March of this year, uh, Roz was named as the CEO of the Walgreens Boots Alliance. And in this uh, new position that she took on, it made her the first, and so far, the only African-American CEO woman of a Fortune 500 company. Something for her to be very proud of, isn't that? And us to be very proud of. And Walgreens to be very proud of. And I watched this interview with Roz and just fell in love with her. Clearly, if you look at her resume, extremely accomplished. Extremely accomplished. Well deserving of this role. But the haters had to say things like, she just got this role because of the color of her skin. Because Walgreens wanted a, a woman of color. She just got this role because she's a woman and she happens to be a woman of color. Not really looking, that's soundbiting. And it's a challenge that's going on in our culture right now when we are not willing to look at how people are through rights of consciousness and through rights of the work that they have done in their life, accomplishing things and how our world in its grand diversity is waking up to creating a diverse and equal world for everyone. Right? Yes. And we are challenged to do our work in the fiber and fabric of creating that world by challenging ourselves when we're tempted to sound by people. So here are the action steps we can take if we are tempted to do that. First of all, to walk through our life and be willing to stop giving unsolicited advice. <laughs> to everyone. Our kids, anyone that we are friends with. And if you just can't stop, at least say to them, uh, I have some ideas about this, would you like to hear them? At least try that to be willing to um, fast from judgment and criticism, to choose a day or a week or a month and say, I'm going to stop with any judgment and criticism. And every time it comes up, I'm going to test it and say, okay, am I just projecting onto that person or is this truly something that I'm concerned about for them? What's really going on for me that I might be projecting onto them? To practice this beautiful Sufi practice that I love that says, before you speak, let your words pass through three great gates. The first gate, is it true? A lot of times we don't even know what we're about to say if it's true or not. Because it's soundbite. Is it necessary? Is it really necessary for me to make that comment on social media to that person? Is, there, is it really going to forward the conversation, forward my own heart? And is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Be the t be, I saw this meme that says, be the type of person that makes everyone you come across feel perfectly okay being exactly who they are. That's the kind of person I want to be. So that's our work, okay? Now, what do we do when we get sound bitten? Because people will sound bite us, right? We hear about it. We, we get, someone does give us unsolicited advice. Someone does criticize us. How do we deal with that? How do we be with that? I love the teachings of Yogi Bahan, who's speaking similarly to the points we were just talking about, who says, if you are willing to look at another person's behavior toward you as a reflection of the state of their relationship with themselves, rather than a statement about your value as a person, then you will, over a period of time, cease to react at all. 
I can honestly say I'm not quite there yet. I'm practicing it. I'm working on it because it's hard stuff, but I do believe there's some truth in it. That one of the greatest challenges of our world is that many of us have grown up believing that other people's opinions of us have to do with our value versus having to do with our behavior. That someone giving us criticism about how we might have spoken or something we might have said has something to do with our value. So we feel shame about it. We allow ourselves to feel shame because shame is the feeling that something's wrong with me as a person versus what we might call healthy guilt that says, yeah, I might need to change how I talk about this subject in the world or how I approach this. And so we have to let go and find freedom from people's opinions of us, all of us, in all the realms of our lives, in our families, in our workplace, with our most intimate relationships, in our church, in the things that we're doing. And I often admire people who are public figures, who stand up in every realm of life, from from our athletes to our politicians to our artists to the celebrities who are in our world because the things people say about them can be so mean and hateful and cruel and unnecessary. How does one keep going when that occurs? It happens to them and it even happens to ministers. It happens to us. And it happens to regular people just living their lives, being brave and bold and standing up. And when it happens, it can be so heartbreaking. Even for me, after 30 years of being in this realm, sometimes it can be so heartbreaking to hear uh, the things that fly in terms of rumors in the community, things people say in the community that we think are never going to get back to that person. And that's one of the, the greatest challenges of gossiping is that a lot of times those things do get back to that person. So I can resonate a little bit with Roz when I can think about things that I've heard recently people have said in the gossip world. Things like, well, Michelle shouldn't drive such a nice car as a minister. She should drive a more trashy car and be more humble. (laughs) Yeah. Speculation as to how I really got this job, that really I got this job because I'm part Hispanic and we needed to have more Hispanic energy in our leadership. I got this job, like Roz, I've been accused of, I heard the rumors that I got this job because I'm a woman and Mile High just wanted to have a woman in leadership. And we get notes and and letters. Recently, I got a very painful anonymous letter from someone who wanted to tell me that the only way I could really be a good minister is if I was in a smaller size body. And that hurt. That hurt. For a few days after, uh, after that letter arrived coming here, I didn't feel safe being here at all. Looking out at this wonderful crowd of people and thinking, One of these people that I love sent a letter to me like that and it hurt badly. And I had to say, okay, I'm not going to make those gossipers wrong or the person who wrote the letter wrong. I'm going to assume that they probably have love in their heart and they probably think they're doing their best, but they don't understand that things like that hurt and are so unnecessary. And I know that that we can feel that pain that I'm talking about because each one of us have had moments like that too, where someone has said something so hurtful to us about their perception of us. What are the action steps we can take to heal ourselves from being sound bitten? And it hurts. It's like being bitten. So my action steps today for this one is to to do what Brené Brown wrote about in her book, Dare to Lead, recently. To create a list, she suggested that we we have a conscious list of 12 people whom we trust. If you're not sure you have trust issues, I encourage you to watch Josh's talk from the last couple of weeks and really get into that understanding of trust. But to create that list of people we trust. She talks so brilliantly about this because she says, here's the thing. Some of us want to sort of say, well, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'm just going to be who I am. And others of us are like, what are, what's everybody going to think of me? What's, what's people, people going to think of me? And that the middle ground is that the reality is there are people in our lives whose opinion we respect, that if they give us loving, kind feedback, we want to be open to it. 
So if their name is on my piece of paper and they say, Michelle, I want to talk to you about something, I'm there. Tell me. Let's talk about it. Let's work through it. Let's have a, a conversation, an authentic, loving conversation. But anyone outside that list of 12, their input that comes in, we take it in, and we ask ourselves, is, is what they're telling me true? Is there any truth to that? I get to decide how I want to live my life how I want to look and be in my body, how I want to express myself so that feedback doesn't serve me right now. And so allowing ourselves to let only people whom we trust give us that kind of input. To choose powerful, self-supportive talk, even if we've been uh, self-sound-bitten. To say to ourselves, I'm going to just send love to that person, I'm going to send light to that person, and I'm going to continue to lift myself up because I know that what I've come here to do in this life is to be the authentic self that I am in whatever way I choose to show up in this life. And I'm going to love myself even if someone out there is having a hard time loving me right now because of their perception. So loving self And lastly, to choose to shine the light of who we are no matter what. Not everyone deserves to know the real you. Let them criticize who they think you are. And that's been good advice that supported me and continues to support me. And the bottom line that I finally came to when being sound bitten and doing some of this work is about people I kept thinking, okay, people may want to to discount me, discount my ability to do the things that I love to do, to do them well, to discount me for the mistakes I've made or the weaknesses in my life or the things that are imperfect about me. And I thought to myself, okay, let people just keep discounting me. And meanwhile, I've decided to be just like my friend and colleague Edwin Gaines says over and over, I'm going to just keep being a woman of power. (laughs) That's my choice, right? And I suggest that for each one of us, that we recognize that people's input of us, just like we say to ourselves, I don't have to believe everything I think. I don't have to believe and accept everything everyone says about me. That the ultimate authority of what's right for me in my life is me. And your ultimate authority of what's right for you in your life is you. And the more that we all lovingly claim that inner authority and walk and talk and live and breathe and be alive in that, the more we bring our gifts to the world, we contribute to the world. And I believe when the time comes for us to walk across that veil into the next life, we will feel proud and happy that we chose to live our life authentically, which is something I know we all want. So as we complete this time together, I invite us into prayer. And I'm going to read today something that came from uh, President Theodore Roosevelt that Brené Brown puts in her book that I think is a beautiful reading about the arena and the temptations with it. So I invite you to prayerfully take this in. He says, It is not the critic who counts, Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of the high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. We stand today feeling those words resonating in this space and feeling our gratitude. Our gratitude for those who choose to stand up and be themselves. Today, on this day of celebrating pride, we give thanks for our LGBTQ community, beings who have taken great risks many times to be their their authentic selves, 
to stand up in our society and live their authentic life. We bless them, we give thanks for them, we celebrate them, and we allow ourselves to take inspiration from that kind of courage, to find within us the places in our life where we are called to live more authentically, as well as to take our place in life where we are called into greater oneness, to surrender our habits of criticism and judgment and stand in right judgment with each other, to stand in love and light and be someone who chooses to, at every moment we possibly can, uplift all in our human experience. Whether we know them personally or not, we know and claim that our habit of mind, our habit of heart, our habit of being now becomes of oneness and connection and loving, conscious conversations. And so we step forward and allow this truth to permeate our being and our consciousness this day and know that we are transcending the sound bites. And in that, we are joyful, satisfied. Oh, we are alive, fully alive. I give thanks for this truth for myself and each one of us right here and right now and I release this prayer into the action of that universal law that simply does the work. I let it be, I let it go. And we, so, we say together, and so it is, amen.